I just I just want to introduce Shelly. Uh, she does have a show right now at the gallery, which runs through to uh, January 11th, although I'm sure the school is closed. I can't quite tell you when over Christmas it's closed. Um, but anytime the building is open, the show is open. And uh, so you might want to go and we have quite a large space. You'll see lots of pictures of the show uh, in, in, in Shelly's um, slideshow she's going to share. Um, I first met Shelly in person um, at the Kuiper Conference with the work of Makoto Fujimura. Uh, and his work also has this concern about um, mending and healing and his theme of Kintsuki that runs through a lot of his speaking. So it, it was it was perfect uh, chance to meet. Um, and Shelley had with her actually these tiny, beautiful, tiny paintings that could fit in one's pocket. Um, that you can carry a little piece of solace and comfort to remind yourself, she's holding one up. You can remind yourself, yeah, that things will be well, that whatever um, triggering trauma you're in the middle of, that that's not the end of the story, that there's hope and goodness beyond that. So, and, and so I had in my head, you know, oh, she makes these beautiful, intimate, small things. And then we got talking about a show and I was trying to imagine how it would fit in the gallery because our gallery is very large. Uh, and she was like, you don't understand. You don't understand how large I work. <laughs> Not a problem, she says. Uh, so it's amazing that she works at this very large scale, um, doing a modern version of a fresco technique. Uh, and also at the same time with these tiny things. Um, so it's wonderful to have her work uh, there many layers over many years of different approaches circling around the same concerns of, uh, of healing and rescue, which comes from a personal level of her own uh, health story. Um, also at a larger metaphorical level about search and rescue teams and flying as a pilot, which, which her husband does. Um, so these themes keep swirling around and she comes back to them again. And <laughs> hello, Danny. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's my little intro. Um, uh, by all means, come to the gallery, but I'm so glad that you are here tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to Shelly and you guys can share your screen. Uh, if you if you want to uh, pitch questions into the chat or comments into the chat, I can sort of mediate that. Um, but we should basically have our microphones off. So the sound is awesome for Shelly and she'll take us through. Thanks, over to you, Shelley. Okay, thank you so much, Phil. I'm so flat, so glad to be showing at Redeemer. It's a great space and a great a community and environment. And I'm, I'm meeting so many lovely people through that. Um, yeah, so I'll get started. Um, the first slide is the title, Ashes for Medicine. And um, it really came from where the last work that I was making um, was these, um, it started with burning and I'll get more in into that, but um, yeah, I think it'll become clear more through the talk, the ashes for medicine. Next slide, please. Yep, um, getting there. Okay, well, here we go. I'll just I'll just say as well for those not so familiar with Zoom, with Zoom, if you you can pin Shelley's uh, video of her speaking so that it's there and other people can disappear and you can just be watching her. You don't have to see everybody. Um, so yeah, I like I like that to pin someone up there. Um, and you can probably I don't know if you can do this, but change the size so that's so that her picture gets bigger and the slideshow gets a bit smaller so you can see both her and the slideshow. Just a little Zoom uh, advice. <laughs> All right, back to you, Shelley. Okay, that's great, thanks. Okay, so, so here's some just a little bit of a tour of the exhibition. Um, yeah, you can see, see great, great big space there and um, 
the, in this little footed dish, I have some ashes from my apple tree and one of the medicine tins and some found objects there. We can scroll through pretty fast. Yeah, that's um, some of the students in the space. Yeah, some of the floor pieces and it even included video. This is actually was a video. Okay. Yeah. So like I can talk over this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the sound's not very loud. So people, yeah, they often ask me, how did you become an artist? Or when did you start to become an artist? And um, the first time that I considered myself an artist was when I was 15. And I was in youth group at church. And this isn't your typical origin story for an artist. But I went up for an altar call. And it, uh, am I out of order? And the pastor said, look, I know this isn't what you're here for. But I just feel like there's this artistic ability in you that God wants to use. And that maybe you should explore that. And um, it, it it was like crafty, but it didn't, um, I, I never considered myself an artist. And uh, I think I'm out of it. And, but he said, you should talk to this other um, mentor, youth mentor. And so I talked to him and he said, there's a difference between having talent and being an artist. And you can grow talent, but um, you're, you just sort of are an artist. And he looked at me and he said, you are an artist. So then I just started to apply myself more to my work and things started working out. And I think it was just because I had this focus and... Yeah, so that's the place that I make art from, from the sort of feeling like I'm playing on the carpet with somebody who's watching me and who's interested in how my brain works and sort of just get the sense that someone else is interested in what I'm doing when I'm making my artwork, even when I'm by myself. And yeah, so that's sort of the origin story. I think I moved that uh, we were going to do that on another slide, but it's been a while since I did an artist talk. I know that that's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> good segue. <laughs> and back to the slides. That, that's a pretty amazing and unusual story. Love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're we're not always so blessed by our um by our minister folk, so. It's good. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and then, yeah, this is the first exhibition after having cancer. So this, this is a picture of me while I was going through chemotherapy treatment. I had ovarian cancer and um, I was diagnosed with the cancer like the same month as um, a big exhibition was wrapping up in Comox when we lived in Comox and that was called Under One Sky. And it was an international residency with, um, with four other artists. And I had just produced this giant body of work and was so excited about my momentum. And then I was diagnosed with cancer. So a lot of the work has, and the themes and things have, were sort of put on hold so that I could just focus on my health. But at the same time, like everything that happens in my life sort of gets integrated into my art practice. Here's another picture of me. <laughs> yeah, which brings to this ashes for medicine um, sort of um, trade of like giving ashes and receiving medicine or like the ashes themselves being like medicine, something that can heal you, um, which is kind of unexpected, but yeah, it's what happens in my work where some, there's like these transformations that happen. Sometimes something will just, it'll really suck. It'll be really disturbing. 
are really sad, but it's like, as soon as I bring it into my studio and bring that problem into my art practice, then suddenly I'm able to look at that problem with creativity and, and it, things just sort of open up where it's like, oh, I see a connection from this awful thing to something beautiful. And I can sort of make these connections. Oh, there's my slide for how I became an artist, which I did already. So here's my sketchbook. Um, when I was at Carte, uh, which was like a open art school program that I did through Ace Art in Winnipeg, I really had a chance to dig deep into the content that I wanted to be in my work and was given a lot of resources and studio visits with other artists and um, was given pre-studio space and allowed to just delve in and thinking about how I really wanted at the core to just help people. And I used to say I wanted to bring beauty in the world. But when I said beauty, it was, I realized it was something more like hope. It was um, just something radiant um, through my work. And so I started just writing down everything that I wanted to have in my work. And some of the ideas seemed really disconnected, but um, by the time I wrote them all down, I could see a lot more connections and they weren't so disconnected by the time I had these sort of threads in between the concepts, bringing them together. Um, in my work, I often write on paper and write on big concepts, sort of like the emotion or general theme of something and then put it up where I can see it and then sort of surround myself with many concepts that I can sort of intuitively gather and um, mix together and turn back out into something else. Uh, yeah, the tree reclaimed ash. This is um, a piece that's in the exhibition. Um, when I was in Winnipeg, we had planted an apple tree. Winnipeg was at that point the longest place that I had lived as an adult um, before moving someone else. All my children were born there and we bought our first house there and we planted this apple tree in the garden. And I was using the growth of the tree um, because every year they produce another set of branches. So you can sort of look at a branch and count how many um, points of growth it has to see how old the tree was. And I was using that as a way to measure how rooted we've become in Winnipeg after somebody said, put down roots wherever you go, even if you have to tear them up. So I was using this tree and it was super meaningful to me. And then after I pruned the tree once, it got a disease and it was dying. And I was given the choice to use the solution from the landscape su um, supply company or greenhouse and it was called copper sulfate. And when I read the list of the ingredients and the warnings, I was like, this is a lot of warnings. Like, what am I giving up in order to use this? Like, will I be able to eat any of the, the food in my garden after putting it on? Like, it's, it kills bees? Like, what? <laughs> is it okay? Does it just, like, what happens? And then the alternative to using it was to prune the tree back even more heavily and disfigure the tree in order to save the tree. And at the time I was dealing with um, medical issues around preventing cancer and decisions about um, whether or what types of surgery and how far I would go in order to prevent cancer and going how likelihood it is and just weighing all these difficult medical decisions while also needing to care for my family. And so it was a really heavy time. And I really related to this tree's problems and I was also talking to another artist who was weighing a medical decision who's no longer with us. And it was, yeah, it was a heavy time, but I ended up taking the branches um, that I pruned off and turning them into drawing charcoal and turning it into ash and then using the ash in the paintings. I'd read about Anselm Kiefer using ash in his paintings. And I was like, but this isn't just any ash. This is really meaningful ash to me. And so I titled the painting Reclaimed Ash. And I also put some of the copper salt in it 
sulfate in it because it happened to be really beautiful, a really beautiful color. And somehow mixing both of these things together in the painting seemed cathartic to, um, yeah, to have both those things together and see them in one place. These were like things that felt like they were tearing me in different directions. Yeah, so the I'll talk a little bit more about the frescoes process. This one is called landscape and restoration. Um, so this sort of this background landscape image and then the restoration in front of it is actually, I was experimenting with it being kind of chaotic and really like loose and not really like precise strokes. Found that really visually interesting. And, and some of that clay is the, some of the clay from the riverbank where I sat waiting for answers where I'll, that I'll talk a little bit more about too there. Oh, so um, Shelly, can you hear me? Hmm. Uh, yes. If I were, if someone just says the word fresco to me, uh, mm -hmm. I think of laying in a wet layer of plaster with no color in it and then painting mm -hmm. quickly into that wet plaster before it dries. But but mm -hmm. your meth your method's a little different than that. Do you want to say something about and how you came, how okay. you came across these tools? Okay. Yeah. Um that that is one way of doing it. That's um the like there there's two types. One is you can have it wet and put the pigment in while it's wet. One is you can let it dry and then do sort of watercolory pigment over top of that. Um, but the thing about putting the pigment in wet plaster is that it it sort of locks in the color. That's how uh, traditional frescoes are able to preserve the pigment so well over time. And um, I, how I started doing the frescoes is that I was doing a painting project um, when we tore down our house in Winnipeg. We basically, that first house we built, we had to basically tear down all the walls except for two walls and a roof and it was we had these beautiful hundred year old walls and I found the walls themselves so beautiful and they had so much history but the layout just was so horrible that the, there was no way we could work with it it had just sort of been slapped together over the years in this tiny weird way and but I felt such a loss for these pieces and that history. And I was having like all these nesting instincts of being like super pregnant, ready to have my first child with this house like totally bombed apart looking. Um, that I just started, had this impulse to save them. And then once I got all settled in my studio and our family was there, I started pulling them out and started sort of, finding images in them and gazing at them like the way you look at clouds and pull images out of them. It's the, a concept called pareidolia. And I was planning to just use these broken image pieces of my house as references for oil paintings because I was working in oil painting. I'd already started doing the little tiny oil paintings before that. But when I got to Carte and the studio program and I set about working on them, I thought I'll just do some little studies in plaster <laughs> um, so that I can just sort of, you know, realize, you know, get to know them better before I do these oil paintings. And I just couldn't stop. I had been a drywall taper for years before then, and I realized how much when I was a drywall taper, there were so many things that I noticed or that I was fascinated by or I found beautiful. And it was always like, okay, you know, shake it off. Like, don't get stuck there. Make everything smooth and make it perfect and make it go away. And this was my chance without somebody, um, you know, pointing at the clock and telling me to, <laughs> to get it done and go faster and um, move on to the next house. And um, yeah, it was just like I fell down this rabbit hole and I had so much history with the medium from being covered in the dust. I just, I ingested so much of the dust over the years and 
like I knew it so well and I knew all the mistakes and what not to do. And I thought, what if I use all those mistakes and highlight them? Um, you know, thinking about the concept of wabi-sabi and these mistakes being beautiful and the effects of human treatment being beautiful. Uh, it was a concept introduced to me when we were posted in Moose Jaw from the art gallery there and some Japanese artists that had come over to Canada through the Japan Canada Fund. Um, yeah, so thinking about wabi-sabi and um, thinking about hope and my desire to give hope. And I thought, what if I built a material language around hope and used some of these marks and imperfections in order to, um, yeah, to give people a sense of this. And I started chipping away and just doing all sorts of things to the plaster. And I felt really emotional with the plaster. Like I experienced so many things, so much chaos and energy while working with the plaster in the past that it just really moved me into a different emotional space and a different energy. And it was really different from the medicine tins, but I found just such an ability to use metaphor and to think about the frescoes as walls and think about the walls as people. And I started doing uh, plastering big papers on the walls and then um, talking to the pieces and having these conversations and saying like, what's happened to you? And, um, you know, thinking about like, the idea of asbestos and um, being like tainted or like damaged or like just, it brought up so many things that I could sort of um, talk about pain and talk about trauma to the pieces. Meanwhile, um, knowing that there are people in my life who were going through difficult things that I couldn't talk to them about. And I ended up using the plaster paintings and frescoes as sort of an intermediary conversation where it's like somebody else might look at that conversation and read, read themselves into it or feel like they're touched by it, but it wasn't exposing their pain and it wasn't um, pointing at them and sort of seemed a way to allow for privacy and just care and sheltering and I was thinking about um ways that clay houses have this feeling of um sheltering and warmth and I wanted the plaster to be like that I wanted to use paintings to convey this sense of um yeah what a, a clay house like an adobe house kind of feels like so yeah, I do all sorts of things with the frescoes, putting pigment into them and spreading it and dry pigment and mixing in other materials. Um, but when I thought about what and read more about what fresco is and um, what pigment is, and we tended nowadays to be like, OK, the, is it plaster? Is Does it come in a box that say, says plaster? And does the pigment, is it pigment, you know, but when you start pulling them apart and reading all the ingredients, we're like, there's all sorts of different combinations of pigment and all sorts of different ingredients in traditional plaster and traditional frescoes that I don't think I, I think I can call them frescoes while not being so particular about only using something that says plaster on the box. So. <laughs> But some of them I do say mixed media on them if I feel like I stray from something that's plaster based or natural material play based because they would use um, clay or straw or um, like a lot of things like that in traditional plaster when they would just mix it up before it just came in a box. Did, did that answer your question, Phil? <laughs> I don't hear Phil. It's, it's fabulous. Thank you. Love it. Okay. We talked about that. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. And I started using some, yeah, it became like a mode of expressing myself and putting energy into the canvas. And that's one where I like threw it on and dragged it across. Somebody 
um, somebody thought, like saw some work that I was making and didn't think that it was original enough when they didn't see it in person. And so I had to like make a piece that was like, no, this is, this is me. This is how I work. And so this sort of like, ah, um, loud painting, it actually ended up being bought by somebody who really identified with that story too. So yeah, sometimes using your voice is useful for others too. Yeah. The, so um, this is a piece that I made uh, in Comox, at the Comox Valley Art Gallery residency. And each of those layers that I put on, since the fresco is opaque, it's not transparent in order to um, get the feeling of looking through clouds, I had to put on many, many layers and chip them off again. But I saved those, like, because I'm always looking for things that might be overlooked in my practice that I can also use to talk about hope and repurpose things and adding meaning to things that might not have meaning. So I saved all these uh, pieces and swept them up and then put them in a little box and then brought them across the country and then installed them in the gallery. <laughs> I, I just want to say it was this beautiful wooden box and you sorted them by color in, in the corner at the bottom there. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was this beautiful thing. Like you're pulling these fragments of debris and you think that's just plaster like shards. It's, it's, it's nothing, but you've taken the care that one section was mostly blue. One section's a little yellow. One section's a little pink. And I mean, they're the colors of your palette. Um, but yeah, they became like a palette and how you had them in the box. So very cool. Thank you. Yeah. And then there I am doing a bit of a, a wash technique, trying to darken those parts that are supposed to be land. So sometimes I do add some oh, more watery plaster. I don't always mix it into the press cup. And then I had all these... Um, I wanted it to be really like zoomed out like an aerial view down through clouds at the ground. I sort of, with the search and rescue that my husband Danny has done and the images in my head of him saying like, we're going off to look for a canoeist on Lake Winnipeg and we're gonna search like four hours, like a radius like this. And I just have these, often these aerial views and like, imagining the land going beneath them and um, so I was thinking about this these concepts of signal fires and letting oneself be seen and um, yeah I had added these um, light spots all over um, in order to have like a really elevated perspective and of feeling like uh, that all these fires were being seen and that you weren't alone like one person lighting a signal fire might feel like lost but there were other people also lighting signal fires and having that in common and then I started lighting them actually on fire after this residency which I'll get to. we can skip over that yeah so while I was making work with these signal fires and depicting signal fires um there was an arson at the uh, just outside the gallery, like on the other side of this garage door, is uh, my studio. Somebody came and lit a dumpster on fire, but the police were there super fast and they were able to put it out. Um, but that ended the residency. It Everything was covered in like smoke and like garbagey smoke, like not like, oh, I'll just use this ash or the, this is perfect it was kind of like oh no we've got to like clean everything and they had to bring in an air compressor and brush everything off and and end my residency early while I had momentum and it was it was sad but it was also sort of like really <laughs> everybody was like okay so Shelly like we want to be careful in how we deal with this because we know that you have this 
history and that how you work is that you incorporate difficulty into your work and that your work is about hope. So um, like, just tell us what you want to save or what you want us to touch and what you don't want us to touch. And so they were really great about that. And I was able to take things off and they recorded the process of me exiting the studio and made that into a really beautiful video that actually projected into the street. So whoever started that fire probably <laughs> was able to see this video of me exiting the studio and turning it into something beautiful as they walked by um, the art gallery afterwards. And the videos that were at that um, at the art gallery at the final exhibition um, are in Redeemer and they're part of Ashes for Medicine and they're playing on a screen. <laughs> So after that happened, <laughs> I started really thinking about fire safety. And after a conversation I had with someone um, in a virtual studio visit from the residency, when they were going through something really difficult, they were sort of in the middle of a mental health episode, something that was like temporary, but really difficult. I don't know everything, um, but I know that it, it, they weren't themselves and it was really difficult for them. And they told me the experience that they had of just how they'd been treated in the past uh, when that had happened. And it got me thinking about fire safety and what happens when the wrong person comes. Like sometimes you don't intentionally light a signal fire or you do light one and you don't get the help you need. And so what about that? Like it was really important to me that we have those conversations that I'm not just bringing up, talking about mental health and causing people to be um, hurt more by not being safe. So what happens when the fire got out of hand? You know, maybe the person, you know, was just trying to warm themselves and then it ended up burning the art gallery. <laughs> maybe they just needed some warmth um, when it was an accident. And what happens when you got burned in set instead? So that got me thinking more about um, the next thing, about wicks and about more domestic fires and controlled fires. And, um, and so in having to exit the studio, I was thinking, well, maybe now it's my chance to work out of doors. And what does this open up? You know, I can't really like light something on fire inside of a building. Um, you know, I'm, I was super nervous about the idea of using fire in my work, but it was intriguing. So they, um, the curator of, of the art gallery, uh, Angela came and David Lawson came and um, he ended up helping me and he had some experience with um, investigating forest fires. And so we, I felt like he was um, a safe person to have around and, you know, he was, had the fire hose, I mean, the garden hose there, should I need one? And I had so much extra precautions. I was wearing all wool <laughs> in this ridiculous outfit that you can kind of see in the video. But yeah, I was think thinking about how do I use fire to build rather than destroy? And the plaster has this fire resistant property to it. Um, my The first uh, plastering that I did was fire taping and it's sealing cracks in order to make a building safe from fire so the air can't get through and fuel fires. And, um, and yeah, plaster just is fire resistant. It covers up wood and other materials that paper that might burn and makes this this protective layer. So then it was like, well, then what do I do? Well, then I can light something on fire on top of the plaster without my painting going away. And it sort of receives these marks. And so I was thinking about prescribed fires and um, if, if there were a lot of forest fires at the time too, it was in the summer and everything was smoky. But sometimes fire is good because you can use the fire to clear areas that might otherwise catch into a, a big fire and get out of control. So it ended up being something that could add safety 
So on top of fire being about signal fire and creating um, safety by people bringing help for you, it also had this other metaphor. And so I sort of reclaimed that experience of going through the, the arson and turned it into something in my practice I could talk about. So this is the resulting image. I chipped it away a little bit more, but I liked the idea of the fire and the landscape together. And there's uh, the big, um, beautiful TV uh, video screen at Redeemer University in the gallery there and uh, a still of um, the, or a picture of the video as it's being like lit up. Yeah, you I, have to I, you have to go to the gallery. Yeah, you see it just see it it's six feet big. You have to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not like a pyro. I'm, I've never been that that kid or that kind of person. But yeah. So then I was thinking about um, yeah, how to use fire to have beautiful conversations, and I was thinking about where we were at as um a society coming out of lockdowns after the pandemic and and experiencing you know do I wear a mask do I not wear a mask and like what room am I walking into what what does the sign say I should do and um there was just so much opportunity for rejection at that time that I was feeling like myself and everybody was just like kind of rejection sensitive even more than usual and so I form, I thought, um, yeah, I, I want to see rejection there, but I want to have it not leave a mark. I want to see it and then have it not leave a trace. So I chose to do it on this piece called Dream Repair that had this imagery of, of clouds and looking to the sky for rescue and that I had done some patching on before um, when I was thinking about my family's fight to prevent and to treat breast cancer and visible repairs and things not being natural and all that sort of thing. And I, I chose that piece um, that was the one that I had kept coming back to when I had these different conceptual layers, I would just keep using the same piece and keep applying another concept to it. Um, the previous one had been that I'd allowed people to touch the painting uh, when it was displayed after I explained my work to a man who was blind and I realized how much my work was physical and that if I let people touch it, he could experience the, the marks that were chipped and supposed to be beautiful and the repairs that he'd be able to feel those sections that were repaired. And stuff. so I did that on this piece that sort of evolves over time. And I formed the letters out of wool and I sewed them together at all the joints. And it's actually wool that my friend, um, she sheared the sheep. <laughs> no, I don't think she sheared the sheep, but she spun the wool, carded the wool, spun the wool, made the yarn and dyed the yarn. And that's what I used. And so it was really beautiful. And it did- that, um, uh, that, that fire on there looks extraordinary in the picture. That's a great documentation shot. It, yeah. it it was um, done from the second story above me as I did it. I'm really thankful to Glenn for getting that photo. And you work on the floor like a lot. Yeah, normally I work on on the floor because I need things to to settle and um, yeah, I don't want it to drip. They sort of dry that way. Yeah, so it it burnt and it didn't leave a mark. But in my my overzealousness to like really make sure it was gone. I did another layer of um, burning over top. So the, on the next slide, you'll see. <laughs> so, but that really also made me think about like how much in our attempt to get rid of rejection, do we overcompensate or sometimes take things too far? <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't think anybody really wanted to see that much fire in that same alley <laughs> where the arson happened. <laughs> so when they was doing like this extra burning, I think some people were sort of like, yeah, where's that hose? 
Uh, so yeah, concept of signal fires. There's another one there, signal fires in the landscape. Um, but instead of just the smoke going over, I had the light sort of drifting away from the signal fire there. So there's this piece called Ac Accidental Signal Fire in the exhibition. And here's a shot of this piece that I was getting ready to add some more details to. And uh, I had like mixed up the colors and then I stood up and that happened. <laughs> and I just like accidentally spilled all the colors that I was gonna use to make a signal fire on another painting on top of this painting. So then it really made me think about like what happens when you, rather than going to someone and saying like, I'm really struggling with my mental health, uh, you know, like let, let's talk about it or like, can we talk or, you know, let maybe just go for a walk. Maybe you don't even tell them that you're struggling with your mental health. You just like go out and find someone to be with. And sometimes you don't intentionally do that and somebody just sees that you need some help and uh, so there's also these accidental signifiers for people who are on the lookout to find and they're destructive <laughs> and i added a little bit more uh clay on the bottom there as well it, it was sort of like well it it's a signifier in a weird splotchy way so um here's some of the concepts that i have written out um signal fires and loneliness and letting oneself be seen rescue clone closing the space between community and those who feel lost like yeah how much effort do we put into searching out people knowing the effort that we go to to look for people who are physically lost how many people do we miss that are, you know, right next to us and sustaining fires for survival. Um, and then thinking about this concept, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And what about the, the wheels that didn't squeak <laughs> and not making a squeak and not making a big squeak? And um, how do we have compassion for other people um, who, you know, might not, be able to talk about what they're going through might be too afraid to talk about what they're going through so um yeah i use like a oil oil um oil stick to that's that's really greasy to make that um, giving the grease to the wheel that didn't squeak and then i used um this is just acrylic on top of the plaster but i wanted to make it look like grease like a grease spill like something really oily, but I wanted to feel rich. I wanted to feel like, um, I don't know, like, I like looking at it. I like how it feels greasy, but also somehow soothing. Yeah. Some things have words, some things don't. That piece was in the exhibition under one sky where um, all the paintings, the frescoes that I did, we just laid against the wall like that. And also um, some panels were laid against the wall, um, like the same size as the ones that um, I created when I did, um, when I lit them on fire, we did the, the video of me lighting a fire on top of the panels and that the fire sort of painted the panels. And there's Lily when I took her to the exhibit. <laughs> but she shows, you know, the sort of the three dimensionality of it. And she didn't write anything. Well, my youngest child. Um, yeah, paintings as installation. So there's another uh, time that I did paintings as installation at the Millennial Library in Winnipeg. There were 16 display cases. Um, and I filled the backs of the display cases with two 32 foot murals cut into pieces uh, to give the view like you were on a moving train. It was just sort of a simple idea, but because of the 
demographic in the gallery and the time of year and people coming in out of the cold. I wanted something that people could just walk into and experience and um, something that people could view from the skywalk at the end of the hallway as they were going by and they could also enjoy it without having to come up and look at it closely. And um, I got to exhibit it a second time um, when they had an opening in their schedule. So I reinstalled the site specific installation again, but I included one of my little tins the second time by using a, a, some magnets on the canvas on the back. So it sort of showed the scale. <laughs> and then I just, we threw in some, some humor about like doing all, all this, um, all this work as an artist and while being a mother and <laughs> here's here's Lily sort of showing the uh <laughs> you you have a book that talks about artist studios and they were they were like basically you should be like unemployed or a man because or like they, they said like are, you you'll have a really hard time as an artist if you have a family or something else like that oh, the, there's that thought yeah it's I'm glad that you're doing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and there were just my littles in Winnipeg. They're older now. There, um, there's much more uh, pushback in the culture against that idea of women having to be single and childless to make it as an artist. Uh, yeah, who, so you know, recently there was there's a residency program actually for. Uh, for mothers with kids like like it's become much more of a thing so I, i'm glad to see that. i'm glad to see that change happen yeah it's really really great i was part of a great artist mothers group through artist mothers of mawa um that really helped me a lot but yeah when you encounter older books and you read them <laughs> yeah it's not a, not as encouraging but but I've had a lot of encouragement, yeah. So the Medicine Tin Project, um, that began when um, I had a friend with post-traumatic stress, um, experiencing post-traumatic stress. Um, we don't always say it's a disorder now. It, it's legitimate to have post-traumatic stress. Um, and she was going through um something and she related a story to me of sort of being called out from her home in the country where she had access to all of these things that soothed her her routine her nature her home and she had to go into the city in downtown Vancouver and go to a meeting where they would determine whether or not she still had the condition and it was stressful enough and she said that when she got there, she was so triggered because even the room that it happened with had red and white swirling carpet, which was a huge trigger of the accident that caused her condition. And I just like had such a sense of how trapped she must have felt and how horrible that would have been, how, how triggering to relive the event in front of people and not have any way to escape and nowhere to go. So I um, thought, what if I gave her one of my little tins with a picture in it of, of nature and something to soothe her, and then she could at least have access to some form of nature. And maybe that's too small of a gesture, but maybe doing something that's effortful and that's unique like that will make a difference to her. And so I gave one to her and she was able to keep it in her pocket. And um, I met Abir, um, a Syrian curator who was in Sweden at the time. And she said she wanted to do an exhibition of them. And that was the first time after sort of giving them these to various people who were experiencing stress and, um, and that I thought that 
might want, like a little painting, just sort of like a pharmacist fills a prescription. She said she wanted to do a show of them. So after seven years of doing this, I started seeing the value in exhibiting them publicly and having bigger conversations about this and exploring the idea that if what someone sees can hurt them or like sort of damage them or break them, can an image help heal them? You know, how much of um, a, a window or like just how much can you heal through someone just through what they see? Like, is that possible? Is it sort of hokey? Is it like, is there some truth in that? Is it just sort of a beautiful thing to shoot for? Um, and how much is an idea like that worth pursuing, even if it's a little bit out there? But as I started doing it and people started asking, like, could I buy a tin? Could you make one for so-and-so? And then it wasn't just me having the idea. It was going through someone else. And they were saying, like, it really helps me. Like, it's really grounding. And just sort of understanding that there's a science to it, that when you look at something really detailed and, and possibly tiny, like in this little space, that um, sort of triggers a different area of your brain. Like the way when you look at nature, your brain goes into this mode of being fascinated and it allows your directed attention to rest so that maybe it was possible. Maybe there was science behind this as well as just my intention. So this is an exhibit um, that went around to different patients' rooms at an elder home in Sweden that a beer curated. And the same little box was recently at an art fair in Denmark as well. So this is sort of what it's like. Uh, this was an Instagram post that I did of a piece, putting a layer on and then uh, didn't have a chance to stay around and watch it dry. <laughs> so you yeah, leave with, and it's one color and I come back and it's a different color. So I'm sort of working um, kind of with my eyes half open sometimes. Um, and then, yeah, art inter interweaving with life, a little bit of art, a little bit of mothering and jumping in and back and forth. And uh, this is a picture of me um, after going through a surgery, after, you know, all that deliberating and decision-making about what was the best thing for me. I did this uh, painting that was part of a breast cancer fundraiser of um, signal fire, at night with pink and I just liked how the pink surrounded this fire and it was just a beautiful picture of even while I was going through all these really difficult decisions there were so many women that had gone through breast cancer that was like if you have a chance to prevent it you should do it and I just felt like I was entirely relying on their bravery because I had none um yeah, so that was sort of the beauty that came out of that, these beautiful people that I met and the ways that I was supported through that. Yeah. And so as I was recovering, um, I had so much anxiety about the surgery, like from the time that I got this diagnosis of um, being predisposed to hereditary cancer, to having to go through with the surgery, um, that I realized like even when I was painting in bed as I recovered that um, now that it was over and I could just focus on getting better I was painting differently and I was able to paint looser and like think more about the background and what I was putting in and um, just yeah I used my brain a little bit more but I throughout whatever I was experiencing I was still maybe able to make the medicine tins because it required so much focus that I could just block things out. And I'd sort of used myself as a test subject that if if I found this beautiful, if this is what I really wanted when I was really stressed, then maybe it'll help someone else too. And I, I like to work with tins, even if they're worn and rusty. I'm like, you still get something beautiful put into you. I'm not setting you aside. So there's me with my own personal medicine tin that, uh, that I don't give away. 
that I just like to have with me. That's after my uh, ovarian cancer surgery. So I prevented breast cancer. And then um, after afterwards, during another preventative surgery to get my, just my tubes out, they found cancer in the tubes. And then they said, okay, we're gonna do a big surgery and take out everything else uh, surrounding it. And um, we're gonna see if there's more cancer and stuff. And there was no more cancer anywhere else. It was just in one tiny tube. Um, so I got almost the full cancer experience. I didn't get any radiation, but I got the chemo and everything else, the surgery, multiple surgeries and stuff. And this little tin was with me and opened some great conversations with some very lovely nurses. Um, so uh, the year of that surgery, uh, one of my followers uh, suggested I look at Makoto Fujimura and read his book, Culture Care, because she saw some similar themes. And um, and I started following him and he followed me back and wrote like a really lovely little message. Uh, and that was really healing for me because it was, yeah, it was great to have uh, a male artist that um, that was not just acting like a <laughs> like a celebrity, you know, like it really sort of restored my faith in some male artists. I, I shouldn't say that because I've had some amazing male artist mentors, but it was just sort of the timing of it. Um, yeah, that was really great. And so I, I loved his book and I was reading that and that's sort of what brought me to Redeemer um, when I found out that he was coming to Redeemer and then came. So um, there I am, you know, working again after recovering from the, the, the breast cancer surgery. It sort of left time, you know, back and forth, but there I am. I think healed and thinking about artist medicine and giving art to others again. And that's my current studio. Yeah, making the frescoes, bringing the fire and bringing things together. That's the thought. Are there more slides? Um, so it's it's not me to, oh, there we go. I just have to do this. There go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can just go through that. Oh, yeah. So I also did residencies. Uh, one, at um, a clinic that had like naturopath and chiropractor it's called Grove Wellness in uh, Comox. And that's when I started thinking about like how to make my practice portable and be like, how, how can I do like house calls and make medicine on the spot for people and really like um, bring things into different circumstances. And so there's, pictures there of me creating artwork uh, right next to the street and people could come in off the street um, in Sweden in a residency there in Tranos and then at the Grove Wellness there and it was really great because the uh, Grove Wellness ended up purchasing a bunch of those panels that were part of that site-specific exhibition in Winnipeg yeah that, that's the end of it yeah, what, what time is it? How are we doing? We're good. We're good. A little, little over time. <laughs> that's that's okay. This has been a wonderful tour through your work. Very meaningful, very personal. The stories that you reveal behind things and your own health, and uh, it just shows. Yeah, this this concern for healing is is both in terms of your own life and and wellness, and then your compassion for others. So. Uh, Thanks so much. Yes. Um, I don't know. It, it, there, there might be people with questions um, or just things that you want to say. So we could open up some conversation or you can write in the chat and I can forward things along. Uh, it's always nice to have a little bit of conversation after a presentation like this. So um, there's a raise hand function. People yeah. Why don't I have enough view? Reactions. You have to click the reactions, the smiley face thing, and then 
I'm so excited to see other Winnipeggers too. Hi, Sean. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Zoom, Zoom is cool this way. All right. So Francis. Uh yeah, go for it, Francis. Just uh I'll just I'll just unmute. Yeah. Can can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. That's good. Okay, perfect. Um I've got country Wi-Fi going here, so hopefully I'm not breaking up too much. Um, thank you for the talk. That that I, I really enjoyed that. It, it it was I I feel like it was a kind of a almost like a studio tour or seeing like into your sketchbook, like getting we you gave a really good sense of your thought process and um the the meanings behind all of this and it it, it, it I'm, I'm I really want to go see the show now because I'm like I, I'm <laughs> in the area a bunch so and I, it's it's I think this is going to really help uh me me approach the art when I when I go and see it um the questions I have it, they're like some of them are, I, I did my undergrad in studio art. And so like, I, I, I'm i thinking on like the technical side a little bit is like, because you are, you're pretty intentional about your, or very intentional about your materials. Did you, with the medicine tins, is there a story behind the medicine tins in particular? Like where, where do you find those? Um, what kind of thought process were you going through with those? Um, well, the first ones, um, the first ones that I collected were when I had my art studio and an antique store boutique at the same time. Um, oh, cool. I wasn't, like, I was sort of too nervous to be like, I'm going to have an art studio. I was like, well, I, I, you know, I'm kind of an artist, but like, I'll, I'll also do this other thing. And it was really great because I had so much dialogue and studio visits and people coming through. And people would come and they would give me and like they would sell me antiques. They would say, I have these. Do you want to buy them? And so this lady brought in like 12 of these tins that I had in my studio. And I kept them for a long time before I got the idea. And so sometimes um, people would approach me and, and give them to me. Some people have shown up to openings. Cynthia is a lady who routinely will like send me them or, or look for them for me. And she's shown up to openings with them. I also look for eBay. Um, but yeah, so sometimes there's there's pieces that have specific stories and sometimes they're just like really interesting. But I try to stay away from like laxatives or like ones that aren't medicine <laughs> that are um, tobacco or like needles or like, yeah. I, I try to stick to medicine tins and I like them to be like small enough to go in your pocket. So they're not like people often picture Altoids tin size and that's much bigger than I usually is. Uh, great. So Sean Jordan, it says there, do you, you have your hand up. Hey, hi, Shelley. <laughs> I'm from Winnipeg, so I'm one of the one of the Winnipeggers. <laughs> so it's so nice to see you. And and I have to say, I just really enjoyed that talk so much. And one of the one of the things that really struck me, like you know, we we've had some talks and and things, you know, strike me when I talk to you. Like you, you your way of telling stories and making connections through your art and your stories just really help um or 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 this magical way of 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 sort of um bridging into another way of thinking and and solving problems and just coping with life or you know reach whatever it needs at that moment and and i just um i just have to say i really appreciate your openness and and how beautifully you tell these stories that uh, touch everyone. Like, uh, and so I thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for being, for making the art that you do, because it's, uh, it's really touched me a lot, like in, in many ways. And I, I continue to learn from it. And every time I hear you tell your stories, I learn new things. And I am really grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. I I know you know that you've inspired a lot of my work and a lot of the. Oh, it shucks. <laughs> but yeah, so I just I guess that was a comment. I I have I have questions, but I. I, uh, I I just definitely wanted to say that, but I, I also wonder, you know, I know giving these talks is hard, you know, you know, especially if you haven't done it for a little while. And I was, but I was just wondering if, if telling the stories is a part of your practice as well. And if you get an opportunity to do that in certain ways and weave that in, because it, it certainly, it adds another layer to everything. And it, it, it's very touching to, hear the thought processes behind and it and it's also a way for people who maybe are on the outside of art and not really understanding it to it, it's like a it's a way in it's a way in and, and I think that's really a, a special gift that you have is to be able to bring people over that bridge and into a more understanding of it and and realize that it is about them too and how they feel and universal themes I guess so was that a question I'm yeah. not sure <laughs> oh, it is you asked if it the conversations were a part of the art practice and it is and talking yeah. about my work it really like completes the work and like that's where the relational aesthetics comes in that the relationship that's built around making a piece of artwork is part of the piece and it's part of my art practice and, but often that sort of happens within the sacred space of the studio. Um, so it, I don't know if it directly translates over over Zoom and doing a talk like this, but uh, I hope that this can also be something um, that's a part of my art practice that can bring more people into it and um, allow more people to have an understanding of what art can be. Awesome. Thanks. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just see if I muted or not. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I think that the uh, speaking is part of your uh, gift. Um, and, you know, it's interesting too, all the writing that you have in the studio, right? So wor words is part of it. You have very abstract work in some ways, and yet words are another whole aspect of it. Um, and um, by bringing those together, um, it brings a different kind of content into the abstraction. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I've also, done, like this one is a buried text painting where I, I took something from a journal, some words, and wrote on it, and then plastered over it as a way to sort of like hide that and like move on from mm -hmm. from those words and to have them buried and yeah um someday um, someone will x-ray that painting and find the word <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> excellent we also have some nice uh comments in the text of people just sharing basically appreciation for what you shared tonight um so that's that's nice to see those comments there um from janet and karen um yeah, I don't I don't see any new hands raised. So maybe maybe that's good. We've been talking for some time. Um, so I just want to unless unless I see another uh, hand raised pop up there, uh, I'll start to wind us down. And I just want to express my gratitude. Uh, it's been wonderful working with you. It's such an ambitious project. Uh, it's fantastic to have interconnected works that cross many years in that beautiful space. I, I feel like there's there's floor work, there's video work, there's large, there's small. Um, and the themes just circle so well. So, um, um, you know, different angles on the same ideas that come back in different ways. It's so rich. So I just want to express my gratitude uh, that you have been with us tonight and so many people could join. So thanks so much, Shelly. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. And uh, really yeah, stay, stay tuned for, we do, we do three professional shows each year in the gallery. Uh, and which is then followed by uh, the senior exhibition of student work. So um, you can follow it on the website or Studio Rats web uh, Instagram is a nice way to see what is happening at the uh, Redeemer Art Department. So I will just wish you all a good night. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>